The text we're turning to tonight on this Christmas Eve is found in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. God's Word says this. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and they found, they found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. Tonight, we're going to look at a very well-known passage, Luke chapter 2, well-known by Many people, even outside the church, because of a little boy who carried a blanket onto a stage in the middle of a Christmas program. Uh, This same passage was spoken by the resident theologian of the Peanuts, Linus, um, in A Charlie Brown Christmas. It's one that we're quite familiar with, and the focus of this passage is on certainly the birth of Christ, but the words that are spoken by the angel. The angel pronounces good news of great joy. Good news. News is is something that's been announced. Not something we do, but something that has been done. And the angel comes to the shepherds and the angel says, I proclaim to you good news of great joy concerning someone. And tonight we're going to briefly... And I know I have a hard time being brief, really, in anything that I talk about up here, but it will be brief tonight. We're going to briefly look at this good news of great joy, who it's for, why it's been proclaimed, and what difference it makes. And so in order to do that, just four simple points this evening, we'll begin here. Um, The good news, this grand announcement of what God has done in Christ is for everyone. The good news is for everyone. If we look to verses 8 to 10 here in Luke chapter 2, we meet this group of shepherds. Now in scripture, shepherds often, we know a few famous shepherds in scripture, at least those who um, enjoyed at least at at one point the duty of a shepherd. We don't think they're half bad. Moses was tending flocks. David uh, was a shepherd as well. And So sometimes in our minds, we can think, you know, shepherds aren't that bad. You know, uh, Jesus is um, referred to as the good shepherd. Um, Pastors shepherd the flock of God that is among them. But these shepherds, if we would have been alive in this day and been acquainted with these shepherds in the field or shepherds in the culture at large, they would have not been looked upon favorably. Shepherds were outcasts. They did not enjoy a good reputation in their day. They lived out in the fields among the sheep. It was dirty. It was rainy. It was muddy. It was gross. And because they were out in that environment all the time, they were not able to keep the ceremonial law and were treated by the Israelites as unclean. They were unclean outcasts. Many of them were scoundrels as well. Literally liars and thieves living out in these fields among the sheep. And as a matter of fact, if you were a shepherd and you were the witness to a crime of any nature, 
you are automatically dismissed as a credible witness because your kind as a shepherd was known as a liar, as a deceiver, as a thief, as the bottom of the barrel. Shepherds really were despised. Actually, with the exception of lepers, they were the second lowest class in society of this day. However, it was the shepherds, these shepherds, these dirty, lying, cheating, not law-keeping scoundrels that the angels, by God's direction, went to first. It was to them that the good news of great joy was first proclaimed about the shepherds. A Reformed theologian and president of Wheaton College, Philip Ryken, says this. Like everything else about the birth of Christ, this upsets our expectations. We tend to think God is for the good people when in fact he is for needy sinners who are desperate for grace. That was these shepherds. And they were the first to hear the good news of great joy that a savior had been born. The gospel is for everyone. There is no one too far away. There is no one too unclean. There is no one too sinful. There is no one too despised. There is no one too far off from God's grace. The gospel, this good news of a savior is for everyone. And if tonight you sit and in your heart you are condemned, you say, God could never love me. If, if you knew the things that I have done, there would be no way that God would ever turn his attention toward me. Look to the shepherds. The good news was first proclaimed to them. The good news is for everyone. And this good news that we're considering tonight, number two, is about a person. This good news is about a person, verses 11 and 12. This is the angel speaking. Verses 11 and 12 say, Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. This word Messiah that we meet here in verse 11 means the Lord's anointed. It refers to the one who was the fulfillment of all the prophets had spoken about. In fact, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For every one of God's promises is yes in Jesus. Therefore, through him we also say amen to the glory of God. The culmination of God's plan, all that the Old Testament was looking forward to, is found in this person, in this baby lying in a manger. The Lord's anointed, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And, and this isn't any mere man, this isn't any mere baby. As we gather to remember the birth of Jesus on this Christmas Eve, we're not celebrating the arrival of some mere great figure in history or someone who would be a great teacher of compassion and forgiveness or a person who would embody a life of self-sacrifice. Jesus is certainly all of those things, but he is so much more. The scriptures make no mistake about it. You see, there is no ambiguity with regard to this baby in the manger. His identity is announced in the clearest of terms. Notice the text says there in verse 11 that Jesus is the Lord. This is the eternal son of God wrapped in human flesh. Jesus is the Lord of heaven. He is the Lord of earth. He is the Lord of hosts or the armies of heaven, the scripture says. He is the Lord of glory. And he didn't become the Lord. He is the Lord. And as we'll sing in just a moment... This Jesus was Lord at thy birth. Do you know him as such? If we're going to be honest, as we said, there's, there's really no middle ground. There's no neutrality when it comes to this baby who's lying in a manger. Um, with, with such a clear declaration of who this baby is, it actually reminded me of a section in C.S. Lewis's classic 
mere Christianity. Listen to the words of Lewis concerning the person of Jesus. C.S. Lewis said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice, Lewis says. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, and you can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Indeed, the text here in Luke chapter 2 doesn't leave any other option open to us. Jesus is the Lord and he has arrived as a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. What humility and what wonder. The good news is about a person, about the person of Jesus Christ. Number three, the good news produces a response of worship. The good news, as it's announced, produces a response in those who hear it, and it's one of worship. Uh, look to verses 13 and 14. I know it's dark, and so you can probably just listen to the text tonight. Suddenly, verse 13 says, there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to the people that he favors. If we ask ourselves the question... How do we respond to such news, to such a marvelous announcement, to that which is truly a history-altering event? What difference does it make? What response does it provoke from inside of us? You see, this good news of great joy concerning the Lord, the Messiah, the Lord's anointed, who is the Savior from sin. This morning we looked at a very familiar verse, John 3.16, and said, really, there are probably no other words ever spoken or written in all of human history than those words. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's astonishing. We spoke just a moment ago about the fact that we are guilty sinners. That we've rebelled against this holy and omnipotent, this all-powerful, this omniscient, all-knowing God. And he didn't consume us in a moment. He sent his son to save his people from their sins. Christians are a singing people. Why? Because Christians know what it is to be guilty of sin, to confess it openly, say, I've got no excuse, but then to be saved from it and not saved in part but saved completely by this baby who would grow up to be a man who would willingly lay his life down for his sheep bearing the penalty that they deserve on the cross absorbing the full brunt of God's wrath against his people so that those who place their faith and trust in him would be fully cleared would be fully pardoned would be declared based on the merits of Jesus, not our own, not guilty. If that's your story, if you've experienced that, that ought to provoke a response of worship. This good news that a Savior has come, we are not left in our sin, we are not going to be consumed by the Lord, but he has sent us a Savior who is a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The good news of what God has done to save wretched sinners like you and me should produce a response of worship. That is why we sing, because Jesus lived the perfect life that we cannot live. Jesus died the death that we deserve. And then Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose in a declaration of his victory over Satan's sin and death and the promise then that we have of 
eternal life with him. The good news produces a response of worship. And then finally this tonight. The good news moves me to action. The good news moves me to action. Simply look, after hearing this good news, after considering the good news of this Savior born in the city of David, who is the Messiah, the Lord, look at the response of those who hear it in verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what happened, which the Lord has made known to us. It wasn't, I hear this announcement, I see the heavenly host. It's like, that's cool, you got time tomorrow? No. Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off, the text says in verse 16, and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child. It's true. And they didn't say, let's just keep that close to the vest. You know, this thing, this personal relationship that I have with God, I'll just keep that to myself. No one else really needs to know about that. No. They hear the news. They see the truth. They experience the grace lying before them in the manger. And they hurry off to tell others about it. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. You get that? Like, I, I know what it is to at times be timid. Be a little reluctant to speak the good news about Jesus to somebody else. How are they going to respond? How will they treat me after this? How will they view me after this? Is this going to destroy the relationship that I have with them? And so we say, you know what? I'll just keep it to myself. I'll let somebody else do that. But here, the, the, the urgency, the energy... The response of these shepherds. Shepherds. It's not like Billy Graham. It's a shepherd responding to the news, proclaiming the news, and all who heard it were amazed. They didn't keep it to themselves. It prompted them to action. Verse 19 says, But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned. They went back to normal, everyday life, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which, get this, were just as they had been told. Verses 8 through 20 of Luke chapter 2. Is it trustworthy? Is God's word trustworthy? Is this thing which he has done to save his people from their sins through his son's life, death, and resurrection, is it believable? Is it trustworthy? These things were just as they had been told. It would be about 33 years later or so, and Jesus would rise from the dead just as he said he would do. God is reliable. God is dependable. God is faithful. And this good news of great joy that has been proclaimed in every nation under heaven is one that is truthful and reliable as well. It's for everyone. It's about a person. It produces a response of worship. And it should, it should move all of us to action. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the news that you have done everything necessary to save your people through your son, the Lord Jesus. Being brought back into a right relationship with you does not depend on self-trying on our part. Some unknown amount of good deeds that we could perhaps heap up and, and hope that you will accept. All of those things are futile. 
Jesus saves. And so, Lord, we look to him tonight, and I pray for those who are here, that as they hear this good news, they would no longer try to make themselves acceptable in your sight, but they would rest in the finished work of Christ. They would hope in him, have peace in him, have joy in who he is and what he's done, and understand the love that you have for them in the sending of your son to save sinners from their sins. So, Father, we pray tonight that we would all be moved by this good news, either to a place by your grace of belief and salvation for the first time or being reminded of such that we would genuinely be able to worship you and celebrate Christmas with an intensity, perhaps, that we haven't up until this point. So we trust all of that to you and thank you for Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen.